All right, so before we do this, I hope you guys won't mind. I need to prove to my boss how many people attended. So we're just going to take a quick selfie here with the audience in the background. Where we go. Thank you. All righty. So this is Yiddish Ninja Presents Programmer Bedtime Stories. I am Greg Bulmesh. I tweet at, at Yiddish Ninja. And uh, I am a technical evangelist for Login with Amazon, which I'll discuss a little bit more tomorrow in my presence, tell a robot, in my presentation, tell a robot to shake its booty. As I said, I tweet at Yiddish Ninja. I blog at Yiddish.ninja. There's my LinkedIn. And I've recently started posting a few interesting things to um, YouTube. This is actually a puppet show from my uh, last presentation. Um, can you roll your own virtual assistant? Which I gave last week at the open source conference in Texas. So these are actually going to be bedtime stories. So get comfortable, lean back, enjoy yourself. Uh, and I'm going to read them to you like I read them to my kids. These are uh, original fairy tales. And there will be illustrations on the screen. And we'll have some fun. Now, I originally had this as four, but that was for an hour presentation. I cut out one. You can find it on Yiddish.ninja. It is King Floyd and the 17 Princes. But we'll start with the Recursed Army. Long, long ago, on the eastern side of the Mountains of Data, overlooking the Great Hiring Gap, the kingdom of Fakakta was ruled by King Verklempt. It wasn't much of a kingdom, and he wasn't much of a king. But it had the best army in all of the kingdoms that peppered the mountain range, mining the mountains of Data. In fact, Fakakta sat on a rich vein of input that was the envy of all of Data's domains. But under the rule of King Verklempt, the mining operation was slow and error-prone. His neighbors implored him, Please, let us mine that input for you and we'll deliver riches beyond compare. Unfortunately, when he wasn't reviewing his fine, fine army, King Verklempt indulged quite actively in his favorite hobby shaving the yaks that roam free and plentiful in that part of the mountains. He didn't keep the hair. For him, the act was something to get lost in. His yak shaving was never meant to be, nor was it productive. And between his powerful army and his constant yak shaving, none of the neighboring kingdoms could get King Verklemt to process all that Fakakta input he was just sitting on. In the realms of data, one trading guild stood out among all its competitors as the most dishonest, scheming, and untrustworthy of them all. They were called the Ganifs, and it was one of their traders who saw an opportunity to get his hands on all that input. So Pisher the Ganif wrangled, wheedled, and finagled until he got an invitation to sit in the stands near King Verklempt as he reviewed his army. The soldiers marched past, each with their leathers and mail clean and buffed, each with their halberd and sword polished to a gleaming shine. They looked healthy and well-fed. As the last soldier passed, Pisher the Ganif stood and clapped with all his might. He yelled, hurrah, hurrah! He bowed to the departing soldiers, then turned and bowed to the king. Your Highness, he called from the stands, would you allow a simple merchant to ask a simple question? The king nodded. Your Highness, this is obviously the finest army I've ever seen. The finest in all the lands, but I wonder. The king raised an eyebrow. Is it the finest army? It could be. Your Majesty, I ask you, how many of your soldiers are above average? Uh, above average? The king asked with surprise. Why, why, they're all above average. They are the finest army in all the lands. Yes, your highness, a fine army, the finest indeed, but have you ever measured it to be sure? The king seemed insulted. Uh, of course I have, he said. But instead of ordering Pisher executed for his insolence, the king stood abruptly and walked out of the stands, followed by his retinue. And Pisher the Ganif smiled, for he knew he had planted a seed of doubt. The following day, the king's messenger came to the inn where Pisher was staying and escorted him to the castle for an audience with the king. Pisha, the king asked, if we were to measure my soldiers to indeed ensure they were all above average, how would we go about doing so? Pisher laid out his plan. They would run each soldier through a battery of tests for strength, speed, and endurance. They would add up all the scores for all the soldiers, then divide them by the number of soldiers to get the average score. 
any soldier whose score was not above average would be fired from the army and sent home, leaving only the soldiers who were above average. The king thought it over, and the next week was spent testing every soldier in his army. They ran across fields and jumped over fences. They lifted bales of hay and even wrestled bears. And Pisher made a tidy side profit by selling the king precisely weighted lifting bales and specially trained wrestling bears. There were a number of soldiers who actually performed particularly poorly, dragging down the average and helping to prove Pisher's point. When all was said and done, the king fired over 3,300 of his 10,000 soldiers and sent them home. The king reviewed his remaining soldiers with satisfaction the following day. They are not as many, the king said to Pisher, who now sat next to him in the stands. But they are the best in all the lands, for they are all above average. Ah, but are they, sire? Pisher asked wistfully. I, I'm just afraid those low performers pulled the average down too much and allowed some average soldiers to slip through. We should test again to be absolutely sure. So Pisher sold the king trained wolves for the soldiers to outrun, and ten stone calves for the soldiers to lift. And out of the 6,700 soldiers the king had left, over 2,000 were not above average. And after the last soldier of that group was fired and sent home, Pisher said to the king, it was worse than I thought. That first group of poor performers pulled the average down so much we almost missed all these others. But with so many. And so it went. Each time when the test caused soldiers who were not above average to be fired and sent home, Pisher presented this as proof that they were pulling down the average. The execution of the test was not complete until no soldiers had to be dismissed and they were all above average. And for each round, Pisher sold the king specialized equipment to ensure the tests were fair. After six more rounds of testing, King Verklempt doubted Pisher's wisdom. Pisher, he said, I have benefited from your counsel, but I have just 612 soldiers left. But I have just 612 soldiers left. I am willing to say that these 600 are the best, most above average soldiers in my army. I will begin rebu rebuilding, using these great men as the cornerstone of a new army. Ah, but can you, sire? But what do you mean? As above average as these 612 soldiers may be, are they any match for all the soldiers you dismissed? Pisher pulled a horn from his belt and blew it. On cue, soldiers streamed into the parade grounds from all directions, but instead of being loyal to King Verklempt, Pisher had hired them with all the money he'd made selling the equipment to test them. And because those 612 soldiers were above average, when they were confronted with 15 to 1 odds, they were smart enough to surrender immediately. In the Guild of Ghanifs, they memorialize the greatest exploits by their greatest members. And because they are considered to be as wily as serpents, they write them down in code, using a language they call Python. Here's the code for Pisher's exploit. Just to have some data to work with, we create a set of 10,000 values with random strengths. When we run the remove below average function on them, if it has to remove any before it completes, it runs itself again. It is only ever complete when an iteration of it returns a result that meets the condition of not having to remove a soldier. Thus, Pisher the Ganeth became the king of Fakakta. And the moral of the story, besides never trusting a Ganeth, never get so caught up in the process of optimization that you let it harm what you sought to optimize. The end. Our next story is a story about communicating accurately. This is called The Farmer and the Giga Cows. Below the western slopes of the mountains of Data lie the two cents plains, miles and miles of farm and grazing land where many a peasant farmer eked out a living. One such peasant farmer was the widow Bissell, 
In the language of the plains, her last name meant small. And though it was the family name of her departed husband, the widow Bissell owned every inch of it. Our other player in this story is Momser the Ghanif. The Ghanifs were a merchant's guild in and around the mountains, and only the slyest, wiliest, most clever merchants became Ghanifs. Or perhaps that's the other way around. It is important to this story to understand how things were measured on the two cents plains, because all the weights were based on rocks. The smallest unit was a tiny particle of sand called a granule. Eight granules made a grain. 1,024 grains made a pebble. 1,024 pebbles made a rock, and 1,024 rocks made a boulder. Essentially, a boulder was a gigagrain. This generally made granules functionally useless for most measurements, but they were meaningful in some of the more exotic spice markets. And though rarely used, there was even a measure called a milligranule, a thousandth of a granule, though only the royal scale of Zuckerberg was sensitive enough to detect one. Another measurement of import in this story is a unit of livestock. For on the plains, a herd of 16 cows is known as a drive, a.k.a. a cattle drive. When her husband died, it was thought there was no way that his tiny sliver of a wife would be able to run the farm. Bringing in the harvest without him didn't go well, and the winter that followed was particularly cruel. Many of her animals had died, and many of her stores were depleted. And so it came to pass early in the spring that the widow Bissell gathered what gold she could say she and her husband had been able to save over the last 20 years, told Marvin the farmhand to watch the farm, and began a three-day walk to the city of Zuckerberg, where the largest livestock markets on the plains could be found. The widow Bissell walked down roads, through fields, and finally she made her way to the city of Zuckerberg. At the entrance to the livestock market, she saw a well-dressed man with a sign advertising cattle for sale. She considered passing him by and going into the market proper, but perhaps her eye had lingered too long, and she caught the man's attention. Good afternoon, mistress. Mom's of the gun of cattle broker. I could not help but notice you looking at my sign. Could not help but notice you looking at my sign. How many cattle are you looking for? She eyed him warily. A drive but quality cattle, good stock. His words flowed forward, thick and velvety. Of course, mistress, I do not deal in inferior stock. I just so happen to have a drive for sale. If you'll come with me, I can show them to you. She looked at all the people going into the livestock market pavilion. I don't know. My apologies, mistress. I thought you looked to be an experienced buyer of quality drives, but I must have been mistaken. Of course, go into the market with the little people, get bumped and jostled and repeatedly outbid by inexperienced yokels. That is when you can even be seen or heard among the crowds. And should you be able to complete a transaction, I can only hope that all those random animals brought into such close quarters haven't been sharing diseases. Have you ever seen a cow with a stomach ailment in all five stomachs? <laughs> With Moms of the Gonoff, you get the finest buying experience and the very best cattle I can deliver. The widow Bissell nodded her agreement, and Momser gave her a friendly smile. Follow me. Momser led her around the outside of the livestock market pavilion, being charming and chatty as they walked, until they arrived at a pen near the back of the market. In Momser's pen, there were 16 cows. They looked healthy enough, but... Aren't they a little small? she asked. Momser waved a hand in dismissal. I assure you, mistress, these are prize, high-density cattle. High density? Yes, my good woman. These are... He paused and looked around as, to make, as if to make sure no one was listening. Giga cows. Giga what's it? Giga cows, dear lady. They are guaranteed to weigh at least one giga grain each. Really? In the accounting she planned before her journey, she was going to buy younger cattle at a weight of seven to 800 rocks and enough seed for the spring planting. She had reserved enough gold back at home to buy feed to get through the harvest, plus an emergency fund. By the following spring, she hoped to have a few calves and a few cows up to the minimum of 1,200 rocks to sell them. But with cows so far along, she did a mental calculation. 
She could have them to wait by mid-season and make enough to cover winter feed, even if she had trouble bringing in the crops again. How much? A few people had gathered... Wait, sorry. How much? Five, rock, five rocks of gold. Five rocks of gold was five megagrains, or five MG, big M, big G. That was basically all she'd brought. She'd have nothing left to buy seed. She could buy the seed and feed back in her village and cover it with the gold she put aside for an emergency. It was a hard decision. Four. Momser's shoulders slumped. He looked tired, but he put on a wan smile. Let me walk you into the auctions. I'll make some introductions, so at least they'll know to look for you when the bidding starts. The widow Bissell gritted her teeth. Four and a half, final offer. A few people had gathered to watch the negotiations. Moms are pointed forcefully off into the distance. Leave now, mistress. I will not brook such disrespect. The widow was surprised. She'd never heard of a merchant who wouldn't haggle. As if reading her thoughts, Momser continued to point as he said, I know the value and quality of my merchandise, and I could not part with this 16 giga grain drive for less than 4.9 rocks. Oh, he was being theatrical. The widow Bissell knew theatrical. Her cousin Blanche had run off with the circus. 4.8. Momser lowered his hand and offered it to her. You drive a hard bargain, mistress. The widow Bissell felt nervous as people watched her shake Momser's hand. She wasn't used to crowds, but now that she shook his hand in front of all these people, the deal was done. She and Momser went inside to the tent to have the ownership of the cattle legally transferred to her. She made her payment, and as she started driving the cattle home with a switch, a lot of yelling and personal grit, she started to feel good. Back she went through the town, fields and along roads. And when she got home late in the day, Marvin the farmhand greeted her with a report of everything going well in her absence. Then he saw the cows. Not bad, mistress. How much did you pay for them? The widow puffed up her chest proudly. 4.8 rocks. For those? They're giga cows, she protested. Marvin the farmhand and the widow Bissell drove the cows into town to have them weighed on the blacksmith's scale. And when the 16th had come off the sale, he announced his tally. That drive weighs 14.9 boulders. But it's supposed to be 16. The merchant assured me that it was a 16 giga grain drive. The blacksmith shrugged. Don't know what to tell you. My scale might be off by a rock or two, but 1,100 of them? No, you got swindled. They drove the cows back to the farm, bedded them down for the night, and Marvin convinced the widow to get a good night's sleep. But at the crack of dawn, she was on the road and walking across fields again until she reached Zuckerberg and sought out Momser the Ghanif. You swindled me! Momser looked wounded. Mistress, I did nothing of the sort. You said that drive was 16 boulders, but when I waited, it was 14.9. A look of comprehension washed over Momser's face. My dear lady, I never said it weighed 16 boulders. I said each cow was at least one gigagrain. Giga means billion, mistress. To ten to the ninth power. Now, when some people count grains, they use giga to mean two to the thirtieth power, which is about 7.3% larger. I meant giga as a power of ten, not as a power of two. If you had only asked for the weight in boulders, this whole misunderstanding might have been prevented. Well, now I know, and I want some of my money back. I did not mislead you, mistress. There are witnesses who saw the negotiation. The sale is final. She knew he had an ironclad agreement and the law would back him. Nothing she could say would feel better than revenge. So she turned away and marched away, over roads, over fields, until she got home. Though the widow Bissell had to use the last of her savings for seed and feed, the cows gained weight faster than expected. The harvest came in more bountifully than she could have expected, and come the spring, each cow weighed in at the blacksmith's at 1.3 boulders, or 1.4 of Moms or the Gunnifs decimal gigagrains. Five of her cows had calfed, so she kept the mothers and babies and drove the 11, other 11 to market in Zuckerberg. Her cows were so heavy and so healthy that a bidding war erupted, and the widow sold the lot for seven rocks of gold. She had replenished her savings, had stores of seed and feed for planting to last until harvest, 
and she had 10 cows. She was feeling pretty good and allowed herself a small luxury of a glass of mead in the Black Turtle Tavern near the livestock market. As she sipped, Momser the Ganef walked in. Mistress, I heard of your good fortune today. I hope there are no hard feelings. None at all. She drank the last of her mead. They were good stock. If you have another drive like that, I'd gladly pay you 4.5 migs for them. Migs? Her voice seemed a little slurred as she replied, which can happen when someone who doesn't drink mead very often gets a little tipsy. Migs. MGs. I'll give you 4.5 for another drive. Ha! <laughs> I made a rhyme. But our last deal was for 4.8. He stopped as she closed one eye and stared at him through the other. But now I know better, don't I? Momser smiled and shrugged. 4.5, what was it you said? Migs? 4.5 migs it is. All right, I gotta go pick up my money. And I'm guessing you gotta go pick up some cows. But don't hurt yourself. She seemed to find this statement very amusing. No one else did. We'll meet out in front of your pen in two hours. Two hours later, 16 cattle were, were in Momser's pen, and he stood with the widow Bissell before it. A small crowd had heard about the deal in the bar and had come to witness the sale. The widow looked like she'd had a bit of a headache and wasn't too happy. Did I say 4.5 megs for these? Momser gave her a wry smile. You did indeed, mistress, as these good folks witness in the pub. Shall we shake on it and make it official? Without joy, the widow reached out and took Momser's hand. A titter went through the crowd and then a surprised gasp as a man in imperial robes made his way through the crowd. Momser looked surprised. Minister Nosh, the widow asked, can you please pay the man? Put out your hand, the minister said. Momser the Ganef complied. From his robes, the minister took a small box, which he opened. Placing a jeweler's loop on his right eye, he proceeded, to carefully, he proceeded to carefully pick something out of the box with a very fine pair of tweezers and place whatever it was on Momser's hand. Payment in full. Momser lost his cool. But there's nothing there. The minister silently handed Momser his jeweler's loop. Momser put it on his eye and looked at his hand with its magnification. There, in his palm, sat a tiny fleck of gold. This isn't 4.5 migs. Yes, it is. Momser pointed at his hand. This is not 4.5 megagrains. Well, that would be migs with a capital M and a capital G. When it's a lowercase m and a lowercase g, it's milligranules. The widow turned to the government official in their midst. Would that be correct, Minister Nosh? The minister bowed. Indeed it would be, mistress. Now, if you had only asked for the weight in rocks, this whole misunderstanding might have been prevented. And since we did this with witnesses and a handshake, all nice and legal, shall we go inside and transfer ownership of the cows? Without waiting for him to reply, the widow Bissell walked into the livestock market, closely followed by the crowd and one very unhappy man. And that is how Momser the Ganef learned to use precise and clear terms and not leave it to others to discover what he meant. The end. And so our, oops, wrong way. Our last story takes place with JavaScript and is about variable scope. And it is called A Dame, Two Spells, and a Scope. And the artwork is actually not in progress. This is the only slide I didn't swap. <laughs> we actually have final art in here. It was the summer after I had graduated from Netic University, the top metaphysical university in all the mountains of data. I had just received my papers in spell weaving with especially high marks after a senior thesis on casting illusions into the magic mirrors pioneered by the great sorceress An. I had created a spell that would allow someone to add the ears, nose, and mouth of a feline to their image by snapping their fingers. I called it Snapcat. It had attracted the attention of none other than the amazing An herself, and she had offered me an apprenticeship for the summer. 
I was to join her in the southern duchy of Gribbenis. It was the capital city of the local area network, a federation of small duchies and principalities that traded along that section of the Schmaltzloos River. After disembarking and activating a mapping spell on my mirror, I found my way to the house she rented at 640K Ram Street. The street was a bit difficult to find because it seemed that the full extent of Ram Street was just 640K. I would later learn there was an apocryphal story when asked why Ram Street was so small, the city planner said 640K ought to be enough for anybody. As I arrived, Ann was rushing out the door. Good, you're here, she said, as if there was no other way it could or should have been. She took my arm and pulled me down the street after her. Bupkis the Clown is dead, and Dame Catherine has requested our presence. She led me through a warren of thoroughfares and market streets that even with my mapping spell, I feared I'd never find my way back from wherever we were going. Gradually, the colors became more primary, the edges became more rounded, and I realized we'd entered the infamous Clown Town district. There, any kind of joke one fancied could be found for a price. We entered the home of Bupkis the Clown, where we were greeted by Dame Catherine, captain of the Queen's Royal Guard, and a dead clown laid out on a table in the center of the room. Aside from one of Dame Catherine's squires standing inconspicuously in the corner, the only other person in the room was the great Schmendrick, a young wizard who had graduated from Nedek at, at the end of my first year there. Bupkis was, I would later learn, the head of the Red Nose League, and had made many enemies. Upon learning of a credible threat to his life, Bupkis engaged Schmendrick to enchant a room in his basement as a safe retreat. Should anyone try to attack Bupkis, he could retreat to the room and invoke its enchantment to protect it from attacks both physical and magical. His enemies could burn the house down on top of it, and he would be perfectly safe for days while he waited for rescue. He would even be well fed. Schmendrick's enchantments included one that would generate a number of Bupkis's favorite snacks. Arne Schmedrick and I followed Dame Catherine down to the basement where we met Bupkis' two, bodyguard, where we met Bupkis's two bodyguards, Buckle, Buckles and Chuckles, who were being interviewed by two squires. She instructed the three men to sit on a bench on one side of the room, on one side of the door to the safe retreat room while she stood on the other, talking to her squires. A few minutes later, she waved the squires away and addressed Arne and me. This is what we know, she told us. The room was enchanted, so not even the great Schmendrick here could open it once it was invoked. Once inside, Bupkis would choose a special word, and only someone who knew that word could open the door from the outside. The person Bupkis trusted with that word was Chuckles here. Chuckles grimly raised his hand to identify himself. The three of them sat for a couple of hours as Bupkis called out occasionally to say how much he was enjoying the amenities in the enchanted panic room. Eventually, Schmendrick here got hungry and went up to the kitchen, but to keep him from poking around, Chuckles went with him. Just as Schmendrick was getting the food on the stove, all three of them heard a scream, then a shout that was cut off mid-word. Based on what Buckles here heard, and the secret word Chuckles told us, it seems he was trying to disable the enchantment. Chuckles and Schmendrick rushed down. Chuckles shouted the word, and the door was flung open by the built-up pressure of blueberry tarts inside. Goop! Pie crust and one formerly living clown slid out. Ann looked down at her lap, where she discovered an errant thread sticking out. She never took her eyes off of it, as she said. And of course, you suspect the magician? Of course I do. Buckles is too stupid, Chuckles is too loyal, and the magician is the only one who would know how to tamper with the enchantment. He killed Bupkis. I'd bet my knighthood on it. On smoothed her robe, looking up. On smoothed her robe, looking up. And you need me to examine the incantations to prove it. Of course. Then let's make some tarts. On stood. Tracy, you're with me. Dame Catherine, Schmendrick, you as well. Buckles, Chuckles, if you hear any, if you hear any screaming, the secret word is stop. The four of us entered Schmendrick. The four of us entered. Schmendrick looked nervous, but I figured if Ann trusted her safety to the room, I shouldn't be nervous. We closed the door, Ann invoked the spell, and she set the secret word. I'm hungry, she mused. A magic mirror lit up to the left of the door. What may I get you? I'd like a blueberry tart. 
The mirror showed an image of a small blueberry tart, not more than two or three bites. How many would you like? Let's say one for each of us. Four? Minimum number of blueberries? Ahn raised an eyebrow at Schmendrick. Uh, he was a connoisseur of blueberry tarts, but his tastes varied. Some days he wanted more berries, some days more sugar, so he asked me to set a minimum number. It's in the project requirements he approved, and if those circus bears out there can remember back that far, they were in the room when he requested it. Ahn turned back to the mirror. How many can fit? Ten each. Then give us four tarts with ten each. In a small alcove below the mirror, a tart appeared nearly instantly, but just one. Mirror, where are the other three tarts? Tart production has completed. Well, maybe it can only use ten berries per request, I ventured. On smiled. Mira, may we have two tarts with a minimum of five berries each? One tart appeared. I requested a tart. Mira, one tart with a minimum of 15 berries, please. One tart appeared with blueberries spilling over the top. Fifteen tarts with 15 berries each, please. One tart appeared looking much like the last. Stop! The light around the mirror faded away and the door swung outward. The four of us stepped back out into the basement. On looked at Schmendrick. Do you have any of the incantations you used? Schmendrick pulled a small wadded piece of paper from his pocket and handed it to On. She tapped it with her index finger and the tiny wadded paper unfurled into a long scroll. On waved her hand over it, muttered an incantation, and then touched the scroll to the door of the safe retreat room. I have cast a difference to detect a spell. If the spell is written on this scroll is different than the spell cast upon this room, the door will glow red. If they are the same, the door will glow green. Everyone held their breaths as the spell performed its magic. When the door glowed green, we exhaled as one. Anne read the scroll for a few moments. Then she said, search for blueberry. The text on the scroll changed. She read some more, nodding her head, even squinting at one passage. After some time, Ahn looked up from the scroll. I think I know where your problem lies, Schmendrick. When you went upstairs to cook a snack, what were you making? I, I was going to boil some eggs. How many minutes? Six. And was your timer mechanical or magical? Magical, of course. Do you have that incantation? Schmendrick pulled a hand mirror out of his pocket, tapped it a few times, and handed it to her. I, I have it in my mirror for easy access. Ahn read over the short timer incantation, then looked up. Dame Catherine, Schmendrick is responsible for the death of Bupkis the Clown. Catherine moved to grab Schmendrick, but Ahn stepped between them. But he is not a murderer. I'm afraid there are some unintentional errors in his incantations. Ahn put down the scroll, then summoned a magical display. Schmendrick had used the increasingly popular magical language from the South Seas known as JavaScript, and a snippet of invocation appeared on the display. I have simplified Schmendrick's invocation to make the error easier to see. This is the function in his invocation to make blueberry tarts. When called, it asks for the number of tarts to be made on line two, and uses a container named num to hold that number and be easy to use. Then it asks for the minimum number of blueberries on line three, assigning that to a container as well. On line four, it begins the process starting a loop to perform the tart making process, using a container named I to track the number of times it's run. But notice that I is used again on line six. Many wizards use I's for loops out of habit, but rather than use a different container, rather than use different container names, he uses the var word of power to command the two I's to each be unique containers. One problem though. Va only makes a container unique per function. Those loops are also known as blocks, and to make a container unique to a block, you need to use let instead of var. So with var and var instead of var and let, the second command for uniqueness is ignored, and the same container is used by both loop operations. The loop adds one to i, then checks if it is greater than or equal to the number in min. If it is, the loop is executed. So when the addition of berries was done, I would be the number of berries plus one. 
it would be increased by one again with the completion of the taught. If the number of berries was one smaller than the number of tots, or equal to the number of tots, or greater than the number of tots, I would then be greater than none, and the spell would believe it had made all the tots after the first one. That's why we kept getting only one tot. But if the number of berries was two or more less than the number of tots, each time the berries were counted, it would reset the number of tots to less than the number requested. And thus, Schmendrick slapped his forehead. Endless flow of tots. Because he kept getting just one tot, he probably just kept raising the amount of ten berry tots he asked for. Once he asked for a dozen ten berry tots, on raised her hand to stop him. I do believe it was related to these containers, but it was actually you who set the number of berries too far below the number of tots he requested. On handed him the mirror with his timer incantation. Min! Schmendrick cried, looking at the mirror in horror. Ahn explained for Dame Catherine's benefit. When a container is not made unique to the function it is in, as Min was not, it is sometimes exposed to whatever larger incantation that function is in, or even the larger context in which the spell is cast. All spells cast within this house run within the context of the house's master spell. Schmendrick's timer spell also uses a non-unique container called Min, to hold the number of minutes it should run. Like the safe retreat spell used a non-unique container called Min to hold the number of berries. It is my belief that Schmendrick, purely by dumb luck, set his egg timer for six minutes, a mere fraction of a second after Bupkis requested at least eight tots. She paused to let it sink in. And he was buried in berries. Container collision, I asked? Exactly. We remained a while longer trying to console Schmendrick, who was distraught over the idea that a spell he wrote had killed someone it was intended to protect. Dame Catherine chose not to arrest him, but he was prohibited from performing any more spells he had written until he passed them through an invocation review by a council of senior wizards and sorceresses. Eventually, we were ushered out, and I made our way back to 640K Ram Street. Sensing how tired I was, Ahn showed me to a storage room on the second story where I was to have a small bed and a desk, haphazardly fit in among the boxes of magical artifacts and bric-a-brac Ahn had collected in her career. As Ahn bid me a good night from the door, I asked her, Will every day be like this? Ahn flashed a wry smile. Today was nothing. She closed the door and the weariness of the day fell upon me. I was just able to think, this is going to be a very interesting summer before sleep stole me away. The end. And that's it. You can find a video of the Recursed Army on YouTube. Even they're happy about it. Um, and I will be putting up a video in the next week or two of King Floyd and the 17 Princes. And the rest of these are available in text format on Yiddish.ninja. Thank you. 